Um, which, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm extremely grateful for the work this town's committees have done the past several years, uh, particularly in reducing class sizes and in building the new Brad Street Kindergarten Building. Uh, both my boys will have the fortune to attend Brad Street School in the coming years, so I, I personally thank you for that. Um, my, my request um, of the boards, I don't really know sort of, you know, who specifically I should be asking this question to, um, and that's perhaps something you guys can help with too. Uh, it's one of process, really, rather than a financial commitment. Um, you know, universal budget agreement has reaped many wonderful benefits the last several years. Uh, but one side effect of it is, is that it has made uh, public debate of where our town should be a little bit more difficult. Um, and so rather than asking the boards to disagree, which seems kind of absurd on its face, I, I don't really want to do that. Um, what I'd like to see is sort of an what an alternative budgeting schedule would look like. You know, the, the five-year forecast for the school system um, expects a 3.5% increase each year for the school budget. Um, last year, the increase was 3.65%, but about a quarter of that was for new services. The rest was for, you know, standard increase of costs year over year. Um, and I expect the consensus will probably be similar for this year. Um, alongside that consensus, I'd love to see what a, a hypothetical budget of what we could do if this year's budget increase, say, increased by 5% rather than 3.5% would be. Um, this would allow for a more open conversation in the community about where our values lie and what aspects uh, of that, you know, in-between area might be deserving of revenue increases or, or some other source of funding. Um, again, I'm not really looking for a funding commitment from the boards. Uh, what I really want to do is just make it easier for us as a community to have important and informed discussions about how our school should be funded. Uh, thank you for your time. So let me just repeat what you basically said. It's almost like sensitivity analysis. What if? Mm -hmm. So what if the school got 5%? As you know right now, without anything else going on, there is a finite amount of revenue sources. Absolutely. So then you have to say to yourself, where would you push back? So that's the sensitivity that you, you're looking for as a part of a dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And just as a way to, because, um, you know, when, when I look at, it, and I'm relatively new to this town, so I apologize for not having been to all of these meetings in the last year. Um, <laughs> um, but um, my... Uh, my feeling was sort of at the end of it was is that everyone had agreement that this was the amount and I sort of looked at it and I said well why and what what would be the trade-off if we say increased it more what would be the the cost in other areas either in you know reducing spending elsewhere or in what it would mean you know balancing an override with with this or something like that I know that's a toxic word in this town and I apologize um, <laughs> but um, but, but just as a way for us to have a real conversation about what our values are in a, in a substantive way, because I don't want to be coming to town meeting and saying, like, I want to plop money down on this and, you know, be legislating from town meeting. That's a horrible idea that I don't think anybody really wants. And so the, the, the question is, how can we have the most informed discussion possible? And um, this is one proposal. I'm certainly open to many other routes of doing this, um, but, but I thought I would at least kick off the discussion of having one suggestion. I have to say it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it does force a dialogue. Yeah. So I find it absolutely interesting. So very good. Any questions from the members? Very good. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mike. By the way, there's time for a public dialogue at the end of the meeting if you want to hang around until uh, oh, 8.50 p.m. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hopefully the meeting won't last that long, but we do try. Uh, there's a new, new technique that uh, someone here on the the committee suggested as far as timeline goes, sort of mirroring what the school committee does, and I think it's great. So, all right. Well, I actually have a question. Yes. Is, is there a topic that you think hasn't been covered at all or extensively enough, or are you talking about a general uh, well, process? I mean, is you there know, something I, specific that you're getting? I will be totally honest. You know, my kids are not in the school system yet, so it's hard for me to, to sense exactly where the needs are most important. Um, the, the, I do. But I, and I think that this would be sort of a way to see where those needs would most, would, would are, are strongest. And as a way to say, if we had more money, where could we put it? What could we do with it? Um, the, the other aspect is, is that, you know, just as an aggregate, looking at our per pupil funding levels compared to similar towns, it is lower. 
and um, you know, I think this this town has done wonderful things, doing more with less. Um, but sometimes less is less, and it would be interesting to see what we could do to try to catch up. And our classroom size is too high, and we're working on getting it lower. Though some we cover some of those topics here when we review education budgets. But is the education committee meetings open to the public like this? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah if you have, a, if you have, yeah. So if you have a special interest in education, I would say definitely go to those, attend those meetings, and, and, yeah, and two, we have two important people here who represent that area. Yeah. Yeah, so get involved, you know, if you have a special interest in that, Absolutely. Th I think all of that is covered in really great detail uh, in the specific committee meetings, and then in here in finance, we, we go over them on a broader level, right. but we do go through the, the budgets in yeah, line item detail. And what I thought I'd bring up here is more of a process than a right. specific right. demands. You know, right. I, like, I, I think I, I don't have a, like, X, Y, Z, this is what we need for the schools list. I just want to broaden the discussion. That's stuff that does come up in those committee meetings. So Absolutely. when you do have a X, Y, Z. Yes. Bring it to the board. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Good questions. Good presentation. Thank you. So, Lynn. Savage here is here to just no, yeah, she she's got three or four bouncing balls here. You're gonna juggle for us yeah. and show us what she's been doing and everything else. Yep, uh, more, more than a few, more than three. Buddy. So then explain to let's explain to the audience why you're here. Okay, so at the end of each fiscal year, um, Mass General Law allows us to go in front of the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen, allows me to, with a budget reallocation, which means a shuffling of funds from other line items within the, the fiscal budget to cover deficits, for example, snow and ice. Um, you know, we might have some salary deficits or, or unexpected things that's happened throughout the year that we didn't budget for because we budget, you know, almost 18 months in advance. So what I've you should all have copies of this, I believe it was given to you, yep. Um, I, I added this year to this particular form the comment section as to what I'm actually doing um, with the funds. So just to give you some bigger overviews of some of the deficits, snow and ice this year was $1.6 million. That was what the total cost was for snow and ice. We only budgeted originally 934000 so a big chunk of this reallocation, almost $700,000, is to cover snow and ice deficit. And that's to avoid having to raise it on the tax recap and raise everybody, you know, and reduce funding for next year's budget. Um, some of the other items which I'm, I'm covering are salary items, either for retirements that were unexpected. They w weren't announced the prior year for us to budget for them. So when somebody retires from, you know, any of the departments, depending on how long they're here, you have a retirement payout, which is any accrued vacation, a portion of their accrued sick time, if they have any personal time. So that can add up, especially if you haven't budgeted for it. It could be anywhere from 15000 up to $30,000. So um, we had a couple of those, as well as, as you know, we have had some um, turnovers in some key positions, you know, treasurer collector's office, assessor's office, um, and in order to attract educated, knowledgeable people in those particular jobs, because they are very important jobs, um, we have, of course, had to bring in somebody at a higher salary than what we actually had budgeted for the previous, um, the predecessors. So we had the treasurer collector's office, and we have um, an assistant treasurer collector that we were paying, which um, was agree you know, agreed upon after the budget was set that we would keep her on because she was a long-time employee, had been there for 30 years, had taken the job of the treasurer collectors, and it didn't work out. So we agreed to keep her on for the year um, as the assistant. So we didn't, we didn't have all of those funds budgeted. So that's a transfer into salaries. Special town meeting, as everybody knows, we had the special town meeting. That was extremely costly. That wasn't budgeted. Um, I've managed to cover most of the cost other than about um, $43,000, which is a part of this transfer. Yeah, it was upwards in the 50s <laughs> for the special town meeting, um, and none of those costs were budgeted. Um, then we have um, the master plan, um, which we had budgeted a portion, but it was not 100% covered, so that's a transfer to cover the, f the final cost for the master plan that's being done in community development. 
Um, and then we just had some other um, small little uh, salary adjustments. There was increases through the year, throughout the year that um, had gotten missed on the budget calculations of about $3,000. Um, and then on the, the decrease side, you can see where I'm taking the funds to cover the $1.2 million worth of deficits. Um, I had salary reserve left over in public safety. Um, some, a, a couple expenditure lines, I had some funds left over. And of course, the, um, the group insurance, $982,000 transferring out of there, which is a surplus. We still have close to probably seven hundred to 800000 in health insurance that will get turned out back to the, the bottom line. So, um, and then we had some surplus in the um, school assessments from Essex Regional and, I mean, from Essex Aggie and the Greater Lawrence. The, the budgets for those came in, the cost came in much lower than what we budgeted, um, which is a good thing because that means they're doing the right thing. We had less students going to Essex um, Aggie, which is a good thing because that means they're coming back here, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, so that's my, we call it the year-end shuffle, pretty much. It's a short, short term to know that we're shuffling all the funds around um, to cover deficits so that we end the year in a positive. It isn't increasing the budget in any way, and we we'll still will have a turn back at the end of the year after the, this, the use of these funds. Is free cash goes into free cash. Yes. Yep. Okay. I apologize. We didn't mention this. I missed it. What about the kindergarten project? Um, those were additional costs through DPW for um, the site work for the kindergarten. Yeah. And I apologize. I didn't mention just. That. And do you know? Well, I guess I can. Ask. I can ask. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, just what specifically? If you knew what it was. Yeah. I know, yeah, I know it was through construction costs and engineering um, on the site work that was being done over there that um, came in, the bids came in higher than what we budgeted. Oh, it wasn't like it was a change order? Okay. No, no change orders. It okay. was just the bids. And again, municipal government, when you're doing construction bidding, you're doing it so much in advance, and by the time you actually get the funding and you do it, it's <laughs> things change. Understood. So, any other questions? On the master plan contract services? Yep. How is, is that with one consultant firm? Or is that with multiple I believe so. I think it's with one that um, Eric is working with. And how much in total was? It was $110,000. Was budgeted. Um, I think there was, prob I think that he, he didn't, he only had like $20,000 budgeted for it. Because I think they were going to push it into 19 but we felt that they were moving along on it, and if the costs are being incurred in this year, we have to pay for it. Okay. We can't oh, take I, no, it. I, yeah. In and a, something in, like this, I... Right, and it's, I know, we want to keep it moving and get it completed because it's been a long time since um, it's been revised. A, a brief statement on the, not the uh, group insurance? Um, as far as the... Why is it such a, always a large credit? Well, as you know, we still have, we budget, Based on um, an increase each year, we know we have the savings in the health insurance from the GIC. And as we said, when we moved to the GIC, we didn't want to use up all of those savings in one year. So each year we're slowly decreasing the percentage that we're increasing the health insurance so that we do keep that cushion of savings to, to use for the purpose of covering snow and ice. And until we can get the budget for snow and ice up high enough on an annual basis to cover a potential $1.6 million worth of snow and ice, this is our saving grace. Because otherwise, if we didn't have this, every department four months ago would have been cut. And I would have been pulling a percentage of their budgets from everybody yep. to cover the snow and ice deficit. When does that GIC savings run out? Um, I would say we probably have another maybe four or five years of it. Yeah. So we, we'll be preparing each year as we go along that that's eventually going to go away, and we won't have that. But by then, hopefully in these four or five years, that we're going to build up the snow and ice deficit uh, budget enough to cover. Because um, otherwise, I mean, snow and ice is the only line item other than, than a legal settlement that legally we can 
go into a deficit at the end of the year and close the books with a deficit because you turn around and then you have to raise that on the tax rate, which means that reduces the available funds for the following year. Okay. Yeah. No. Is there 300,000 left in the uh, group of trends? There will be there after will be. I remove this, yeah. And, and you think that's four or five years? If we had another well, year like this? Well, it's 800 this year, and then next year we have a budget. This is what was left of the budget. Okay. Okay, so when we build the budget, as you know, you got the revenue source, we build the budget around the revenue source. So we built, say, uh, you know, $10 million for health insurance. Right. If we don't use all of that, that goes to the bottom line and falls back and builds our cash back up because okay. we don't have it reserved anymore. Yep. Was, was I just one more question. Is that typical? Yep. This is my first year looking at all yep. this. Was it, was it about a million dollars, give or take? Is that pretty? Yep. From your perspective? Yeah, this, it, I could produce these copies of these for the last um, probably 10 years. It's been, it, we do the same thing at the end of okay. the year. And health insurance has been able to use the health insurance surplus since we've been to, changed to the GIC, which is in 2013. Okay. Yep. So, what I need is the committee to vote that they approve this, and then you, Tim, as the chair, have to sign this, which then I'll go to the Board of Selectmen. Any On further questions, comments, discussion? I have a question regarding the special town meeting. Is this yes. what you're talking about, the January meeting that we had? The special Not the annual. We budget for the annual. Yeah, it was the special for the, for, the, January, right? for the cannabis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when we uh, call for a special town meeting, uh, and again, this is just yep. a question. Yeah, yeah. And uh, sh or aren't we or shouldn't we uh, uh, ask uh, the customer to the petitioner, the, the petitioner, yeah. to put the bill to bear the cost. Um, Why should the town bear this? I guess you could, but we didn't. <laughs> I think uh, I. I so is it is. I don't think you could. Business, right? right. But say it was a group of citizens, right. then it'd be an infringement on their ability as citizens to influence government, right? I mean, no, right. but they, are, right. they asked because of the Take. time constraints. They asked for a special town meeting, so. But but yeah. in in all cases, right? It's not necessarily just a, a, a private business that would that would do that. It could be a group of citizens who, for other time constraints, require it. And I don't know how so you could. So then only the people with lots of money could call town meeting. There you go. Right. right. Yeah. It would be. Right. And, and yeah. Yeah. Divya, there are people who are warranting that special town meeting for yep. from the citizens. Yep. I assume most of this fifty thousand dollars was police yep. to do the parking. The police, the the videoing, um, the, the town clerk's the, office. The town right. clerk's office, 100%. All the work that the town clerk's office does to set up a special town meeting because you have to record it, you have to have the sound, um, you have to pay all those people that are, are working the sound, you know, yeah. producing all the documents, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the election work is the and the, the work is that actually take and you know record everybody coming in. It, it, there's a lot of them. <laughs> So, yeah, it gets it's expensive. Well, finance committee meetings are still free, which makes it I a know. bargain. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion, questions, comments? I need a motion. Can I pass that around so he can sign that? Volunteer. Um, move that we approve the town of North Andover budget reallocation dated June twelfth. 2018 and presented by Lynn Savage. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's so approved. Sign. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you very much. Yeah, you too. I know. I I quit band and joined chorus in middle school. Well, <laughs> yeah, she was in chorus. Yeah. Band is awesome. Band is awesome. I know. My daughter was in big, big time. It's great. It's all awesome. With that, I introduce uh, 
Amy, the main event. Amy Mabley and Greg Gilligan, um, representing the school, in particular the school committee and the superintendent's office. Uh, Amy is the chairperson for the school committee. And then you're done. I wanted to put you on the hook. And then uh, Greg right. is in two weeks, will be the official, not soon to be, but will be the That's superintendent. Right. Uh, he is definitely uh, already filling a lot of those responsibilities just by being here. And welcome and congratulations again on your uh, appointment. Thank you. Um, I you asked there? in particular the school budget process, Amy, as the point person for the school committee at the present time to discuss the, they're the ones that set the directions, the guidance, and provide all of the policy and procedure to right. the school administration. It is then Greg, incumbent upon Greg and his team to execute to that plan. So I've really felt that the two, both Amy and Greg being here, could brief us on just that. Uh, part two to their presentation is to talk a little bit about the North Andover Middle School project. Yep. Sure. Okay. Sounds Thank good. You. So while um, Magician is working on the screen over there, <laughs> um, so the, 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 Tim's absolutely right. So the key thing to understand, if anybody doesn't, is that the school committee does not build the budget. It is the school committee sets the directives and the direction for um, what they, we as a group want to see, and then um, the superintendent is the um, budget officer. I actually looked up the policies. The budget officer who um, prepares the budget working with the leadership team, et cetera, and I think the leadership team is about 25 people, principals, uh, other superintendents, et cetera, assistant superintendents, um, presents the budget to selectmen, to you all, to the school committee, and um, that part, and then administers it afterward. So I don't know if you remember during town meeting, a big um, timeline was put out, I think by the um, town manager about how the town budget is built. We do a very similar thing, so in August, we start with a retreat, um, which is just a meeting, but we get to, to looking at any tweaks to our um, strategic plan that we're going to be looking at next week, the, the new draft um, coming from the superintendents, and then um, any adjustments to our goals for the year that all come out of the strategic plan. And in the last couple of years, um, we've gone to having um, superintendent goals um, and school goals, but also shared goals with the school department and the school committee. That, and for instance, one of the big ones we've had the last couple of years is the reducing class size. And then from there, um, there are many, many meetings. Um, budget is, uh, the the um, future budget is part of um, our meetings, starting usually in late November for several meetings. And then we, um, the presentation's made in January. Then we um, have two meetings about that. And then we have a uh, public hearing. And then um, take it all down the road to all the rest of to the selectmen and um, you all. So that's kind of our timeline, I would say, right? Yes. I wanted to say thank you for inviting me here tonight. Uh, I want to have an opportunity to just introduce myself. I really look forward to taking over in a couple weeks. Um, <coughs> and yes, uh, Mr. McMillan, uh, there is some technical difficulties with the top screen. We've got the side <laughs> over here, so I don't know if folks want. <laughs> yeah, you know, your side it's fine. Sausage, um, I can't see. <laughs> but an, op an opportunity tonight, um, uh, Chair Mabley is going to take us is going to take us through uh, with some input from me as well uh, through this budgeting process. But I'm pretty excited about in North Andover having a strategic plan, having a five year curriculum plan, a five year student services plan. I think that's really made all the difference because we've we've set goals with benchmarks and milestones, and it's pretty remarkable in the last couple of years what we've been able to meet, uh, particularly around curriculum. Lucy Calkins writing. Lucy Calkins reading is a new implementation next year. Eureka Math. Eureka Math, Foundations, Phonemic Awareness Program, um, Project Lead the Way at the High School, Computer Science, so, and Next Generation Science Standards at the Middle School. So we'll take you through this, and we'll have a chance to talk about the process, but also about where we are, um, in terms of our plan going forward and how we get there and the careful consideration and deliberation that we do uh, as a team um, and then also in a public forum as well input from a lot of folks so that's right yeah. so um, 
I kind of we just kind of just went over all this sort of stuff so we're gonna get into more detail but we there's a strategic plan and we set the directives as a school committee again um, in September they kind of get finalized in the our public meeting and then the um, school the, the superintendent is the um, leader on that with his team to work on the budget for the next several months and Jim Mealy who is assistant superintendent of um, finance and operations um, he you know prepared a lot of this and, and he's he's our Lynn Savage if you will so um, he he does um, a lot of work on that and as I think was also mentioned in town meeting you know the day after town meeting ends you start on the next budget and it's the same kind of thing um, so these are the types of things that are looked at and we're gonna get into detail um, on this yeah feel free to yeah, sorry about that. No, no. Yeah, um, I'm sorry about the big TV we need uh, some well, you're good at this. Okay. That'd be great. That'd be great. Because that's the bigger one. And, and, and we can even talk while you mess around. Because this slide, even if you make it up there, you won't be able to read it. <laughs> I'm hardline, but I can Chromecast. Um, yeah, we'll just wait. Well, that's pretty. <laughs> I like that. Leave it there. the finance committee, Bucky. That's right. That's <laughs> great. Can we do that? <laughs> Jen. What? I'm not Bucky. I think it's okay. I know. Seriously. I just was there. <clears throat> Are you casting already? Um, give me one sec here. I have Apple TV or a central office meeting room. Those are my two choices. We don't have cats there. So we'll go back to what you just did. Okay. So you have cats because you're right. And you're on HDMI, right? I'm on yeah. HDMI, yeah. I think we just have to adjust the input up there. Um, I did not bring an extra. Okay, so I thought that they actually all got them. So sorry about that. I thought that we all received them. Okay. I can get it to you after if you need to. Or... There you go. All right. 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 Thanks, Jen. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to acquire this Just knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> by error in our own meetings? Yes. Many times. I know. Yes. Many you times. Did, you did it. It good took me two meetings and a few younger people to help. Pretty good for someone with no sleep. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we can, Stan. Thank you. We're a difficult group, sorry. No. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, yeah. Helpful, though. There you go. Awesome. Okay. So... Our strategic plan is really comprehensive. It really focuses on three main areas. All students, professional practice, and consistent and rigorous curriculum. Um, and underneath, underneath each, we have different initiatives that we're working on. Um, and I can kind of walk you through a few. But in terms of consistent and rigorous curriculum, one thing I want to talk about tonight is our Medicaid funding and what we've been able to do with the Medicaid funding over the last couple of years and the huge efforts to go out and get those forms signed um, so that we can get that reimbursement uh, to a curriculum line, which is up to $400,000 this year in perpetuity for curriculum. Um, so under curriculum, for example, um, we've had the ability to <clears throat> implement, um, you know, so for each one of these, and, and I'm not sure how many have been on our website to take a look, um, for each one of these, we have goals with milestones, who's responsible, and how we're going to get there. So. Consistent and rigorous curriculum has been a huge undertaking here in the public schools in North Andover. Um, like I said, the implementation of Eureka Math grades K through 6, Lucy Hawkins writing out of Columbia University Teachers College K through 8, uh, Project Lead the Way Computer Science at the high school, Next Generation Science Standards in grades 6, 7, and 8, a phonics program um, K through 2, which was accelerated through uh, Donations. a very wealthy, a very uh, generous donation by a town member. Uh, we were able to accelerate that for a year. So we're very deliberate and thoughtful, particularly around <laughs> curriculum, because um, not only does it involve getting the appropriate curriculum materials, it also involves the appropriate implementation in terms of a timeline, professional development, and all the planning that goes along with it. Um, so next year we'll be rolling out Lucy Hawkins' um, reading and that's going to be rolled out in, in kindergarten next year uh, with a staggered rollout after that now how do I get back here I know you you jumped the I can you just hit the back arrow no nope, that's a different 
presentation. That's your entry plan. Nope. Well, I don't want that one. <laughs> there you go. How'd you do that? It's good. I don't, oh, you're almost, oh, you need to go back one more? I don't know how you do that. I don't know how I did it, but... <laughs> Can you just press the back arrow? Oh, here we go. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So in terms of, you know, curriculum, in terms of professional practice, and we're looking at our professional practice goals, um, that has to do with our structures around collaboration, how we look at student work, how we develop and uh, implement professional development. Um, I know that um, there was some interest from someone in this group about our pretty robust offerings this summer in terms of professional development. Uh, it's exciting. We're probably one of the few districts that have um, such a catalog to offer our teachers in order to maintain their certification and also grow. Um, so in terms of professional practice, it is it really uh, encompasses everything from a comprehensive human resource model um, to rigorous professional development and training for teachers um, with similar initiatives and benchmarks along the way. And literally, we could go through this, you know, I, 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 I'd encourage you to take a peek at this later on because it's, there's quite a bit here. Uh, and the other objective is all students. I think one of the things that's important for, for folks to understand is um, it's important for us to challenge the high flyers. It's important for us to, what are we going to do for kids who, who are not learning? Um, and when we say all students, we mean all students, uh, special education, English learners. North Andover's had a rapidly changing demographic uh, that I'm not sure folks are, you know, that all folks are aware. Um, Actually, you know, can I interject one thing yeah. there? So at the um, graduation last Friday night, um, Principal Chet Jackson gave a speech and he put out a statistic that I think I heard talked about the whole weekend was in the graduating class uh, last Friday night, there were um, students representing being born in 25 countries. Yeah. Um, which I was surprised to hear, actually. So that was pretty. Does that imply that they're not English speaking? They don't learn English. Not necessarily, but they were born elsewhere and yeah. came here. They or could have come here at culture. six months old. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all, but just the fact that um, we're much more diverse than people realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, North Andover probably 15 years ago was a community that was 90% white. Now we're closer to 74.3 ish. Um, we've had, we have quite a. Um, he knows his stats. Give or take point two. Uh, but we have, a, we have a large Hispanic population. One of the big influxes as of late has been uh, uh, Portuguese-speaking um, folks that have been moving to the community from Brazil. Um, we have over 30-plus languages spoken in our public schools in North Andover. And just for a quick little stat, and I don't want to get off this. I usually Can you use, tell he loves all this stuff? I usually use straight PowerPoint or Google Slide. Um, but, no, it's OK. Um, I'll get it after. Anyway, it's, it's fascinating. If you ever get a chance to go onto our academic website here in North Andover, go to the English, learning, English Language Learners page, and it's a breakdown of all the different languages spoken by our kids who came here as non-native speakers. So um, those are the kids that we actually service as English language learners. Most of them um, test out by the time they're in middle school or high school. Uh, so the population is predominantly in elementary school. I think the other thing about the shifting dem demographic in North Andover is we have two elementary schools in North Andover that are, that are over 50% free lunch. That means 50% of the students receive free or reduced lunch. Um, and that surprises a lot of people when they hear about that. So when we want to meet the needs of all students, it's complex because we want to meet the kids that get it right away. We want to meet the needs of all students who receive special education services, students who re receive English language learner services, students who receive Title I services because they're behind and they live in poverty. Um, so it, it, it's quite a mix. And that's really when we set up this plan, and you can see all the different initiatives as you go through each one. This sets the, 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 the goals and charts the course for us here in the public schools. Within here is a five-year curriculum plan. There's a student services plan. On the 21st of June, we'll be presenting where we are for next year. Now having said that, one of the things that really impacts this plan is the data that we collect as we go. So I'm really fortunate because I'm coming in with a pretty comprehensive entry plan that I presented to the school committee the other night. And it, the, the questions really 
and there'll be a survey going out to the entire community. The questions are around what are we doing well, what do we have concerns about that we want to address, um, what about the decision pr making process here in North Andover? Do you feel included, not included? There'll be one on communication. Uh, one's going to talk about the rapidly shifting demographics and the diversity in North Andover, which I think is our strength. But are we meeting the needs of all kids? And what are some other uh, ideas people may have? Um, and then two last components to it be you know, folks could add a new program, whether it's extracurricular activities, academic, what may that be and why? And lastly, what advice do they have for me? is the new superintendent in the schools. So that is, um, I'm pretty lucky. Bev Zagari, who's the assistant of the superintendent, has become a wonderful coder uh, and is someone who just finished his dissertation at Boston College. Um, I think it would be nice to have someone helping me with the coding because I've done a lot of coding in the last couple months. Um, so that's the strategic plan and that really charts our course. I just have some questions. So mm -hmm. how are you meeting so when you talk about meeting the needs of all students, that's a, I've lived here my whole life and those were pretty um, eye-opening, you know, pieces of information. You'd have to so under all those things. Right, right. So in terms plans. of um, just to ask about um, availability that, of classrooms opening up and stuff like mm -hmm. that in the elementary schools, is that helping you serve those students? Is that now giving us the opportunity as a community to have those spaces to, to take those students out of normal classrooms to give them the services they need? I'm just trying to make like the connection on, on how that's helpful. Well, it, it, it's very helpful. I think two things is one is opening up the, the new Brad Street mm -hmm. is remarkable in the sense of um, we're heading in there with 16 teachers. The plan was to head in with 15 teachers. We've made a really deliberate decision as a leadership team to, to go with 16. Um, so we'll be able to distribute the classes evenly across the way um, because sometimes you fill up a class because there's pressure points and streets in the Franklin district or the Thompson district mm -hmm. and you have to move someone from one district to the other. The other thing it does by, by, by moving out those 15 classrooms is it now gives us the appropriate spaces to be able to service music, art, um, English language learners, special education programming. You know, we're, we're in the works right now of I don't know how many of you know, but we've made significant progress with our social emotional learning program and special education program in terms of educating North Native kids, bringing them back from out of district programs, which are very costly, um, and transportation is extremely costly, back to North Ando because A, they deserve to be educated in their own community with their own peers, and B, we think that's what's best for them. But it also uh, gives us the ability to do that. You know, so we have the ability, you know, next year to be able to look at a therapeutic program that we want to expand that's at the Kittredge School to another school because now we'll have the space. You know, in the interim, um, many don't know, um, there is a, a plan, a facilities master plan phase two where there'll be renovations to the Kittredge, Franklin, and the Atkinson School. In the interim though, um, you know, to backfill the spaces we want to backfill in order to get to a percentage within all of our classes within the recommended guidelines by the school committee, would need 10 teachers. But over the last two years, we've earmarked and put five teachers in, thinking ahead. So, we're, so we've already cut the 10 to five, and in the next two budget cycles, I'm confident that we'll get five teachers in to get all the elementary classrooms below the recommended school committee guidelines. Now, five years ago, if you had said that to me, I'd say, that's a joke. Um, we had five years ago, most we had 50, several classes, over 50%. dozens, dozens of classes in this district capped at 28 and 29 kids, depending if they were K to 2 or 3 to 5. This year, we only have one class in the district that's capped. The Thompson fifth grade is at 28. My daughter's class. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so that's a short answer to your question. And there's going to be quite a bit throughout this presentation. So um, if you want to really get to the heart of a matter, that's really a nice question, a nice way to do it. So I hope that answered it. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you. So, um, and, and if you do click under all those things, you've seen those charts, there's an inordinate amount of information there for you to enjoy. Um, but I was going to mention the same thing that um, Greg just did about, so, you know, as a community, we made the decision um, at town meeting last year to, to build the Ann Brad Street School. The year before that, as a, um, a, a um, department with the superintendent and as a school committee, we made the decision to take that um, to the selectmen, to the town, as a, a proposal, right? And we had three different options, different financial ways to do it, um, because we 
one of our main things, as you see here, is to reduce class size. Um, starting with the middle school was not something we could get done quickly, but starting with building a new kindergarten using you know, funds that the town already had was a much faster way to, to get to a lot more students very quickly. So way back before even the um, kindergarten, the, the, the ad and brass sheet was approved, um, the superintendent and the team started putting in space holders for teachers for when we have the rooms, you will be able to put the teachers in place. So had that not been happening for before the program was even put, um, agreed to, we would be today moving everybody and still needing 10 teachers. But because they started doing that three years ago, we only need five. Another thing that was done um, last year was um, we really could have used you know, another teacher over at Franklin, I think it was right, well, at one of the places. And so what happened was all the elementary principals got together and they trimmed their budgets. Even though they weren't gonna get, let's say Thompson wasn't gonna get the teacher, they gave money toward getting that extra teacher on the books because they knew it was a short-term situation. Atkinson added a fifth grade knowing that they're putting them kind of like in a, in a non-real room for one year because they knew that they would be able to fix that when people were moved out. So people really um, worked together and collaborated to um, achieve what's necessary um, early so that when the rooms are available, we already have that teacher in place. We don't have to start with 10. We're only at five at this point. Um, and I as you. Sorry, I just have a quick question about that. So yes. You say that you were holding space for them. It's, it's built into the budget, but right. they're not employed. Right. So what and happened was th three years ago, a budget was put in for a teacher. Yep. That money was spent on some curriculum materials, but it was put in as a yes. placeholder. Okay. Just um, so yeah. make sure I was. Yes. I want, you, you all remember. Yeah. And, and so I, before we got the Medicaid, before we yes. got the Medicaid I just, funding, I just wanted to be clear yes. that I was. Yeah. So that, that kind of thing. That fifty-five thousand dollars was the first money spent towards curriculum renewal mm -hmm. or new materials right. in almost eight years in the district. Yeah. So. Right. So, but that was kind of the, you know, people ask, are you are you making long range plans? Are you are you you know just taking whatever increase you get and doing the best you can? A lot of planning is going to, to make these things happen. So that was one example I just wanted to, are we to mention. Medicaid funding? You said before we got the Medicaid funding. Is that something? We're going to get to that, but yeah. I'll get to it. Do you want me to explain it now? I mean, it might go a little oh, better with the. You can, you can stay. Just stay on. Okay. But yeah, it's I'd it's exciting. That. Yeah, <laughs> be happy to explain it. I think the one thing that's critical for folks to understand is we have a we have a leadership team um, that focuses as a team as we're a district. You know, years ago it would be elementary principals all over elementary, middle school for middle school, high school for high school. There was one year, not too long ago, where we cut $3.1 million out of the budget. And it basically was a million at each level. If you can think about how devastating that could be. It was 2005 or six, um, And th we've come such a long way that we've added that 16th teacher to the classroom for elementary, for kindergarten, and that's not only trimming a little bit from each budget, the middle school and the high school chipped in as well. That's the kind of team attitude that we have to have uh, in, right. in order to move forward. So these are the types of directives that, um, and as you can see, these directives come straight out of the strategic plan that you saw earlier. Um, and so that's really, I think, all you need to look at there. And I think that's important to notice is that, you know, we have a plan, so it's not, you know, if we have, if we, if, if this comes or we get something more, it accelerates the plan. Um, but we definitely have to work together as a team. School department funding sources, obviously there's the general, bunch of them. <laughs> general fund, revolving accounts such as, you know, things like community programs, grants, and grants, there are entitlement grants um, that you get from the state, and those change sometimes depending on census. Um, calculations, etc. Um, but we get those to service, for example, our Title I students who receive free lunch, free reduced lunch, um, who are not making academic progress in order to provide extra time and support for those students, um, which is important. You know, I think the other thing that people should know is that we've really worked hard on bringing in grants that most communities don't get, competitive grants. Um, we just got a grant for mathematics called ST Math that's going to bring in, a, it's, a, it's, it's worth about $140,000 over the next three years uh, that, we'll pi that we'll be piloting next year at three elementary schools with the hope of applying with the other two for grants. That's not part of the core curriculum. It's above and beyond, but it's a really nice thing to have, for example. Um, Circuit Breaker is funding for, as you guys know, Circuit Breaker well uh, from special education. Um, capital projects, indirect costs, shared expenses. 
I think one Pretty of the things, I think one of the things, you know, we're going to get into these, so <laughs> thank you, Ms. Mabley, uh, as we go. Medicaid reimbursement and the Special Education Stabilization Fund. So there's been a lot of planning and foresight into how do we deal with these things that come up. I mean, a kid could move into our community and it could uh, become a $250,000 cost overnight, literally overnight, um, you know, that we have to meet. So the general fund um, is exactly what you're, you're used to seeing, what we need to basically run the schools um, for the school year. And for whatever increase we get um, annually, about 3% of it, a little over 3% is this, to make sure we can have level services um, from the year before. Um, so that's kind of the basic thing with that is. Revolving accounts, um, neat thing to know here, I think in particular, um, if you look at under independent of, um, general fund, the food services and the community programs are self-sustaining. Um, meaning that whatever they bring in and whatever they spend, they bring in through um, through fees and what have you. And if there is any um, surplus at the end, their goal is not to have surplus, but if there is, it, it gets put forward into the next year. Um, so those things are, are basically a zero budget spot because they take care of themselves. Uh, we just talked about grants. You know, and those come in typically entitlement grants. And for example, those those can change. I mean, the timing on them isn't great. Title I, for example, comes in about July is when we get it for the start of the school year. So those positions always go out with letters saying they're grant funded. Um, you know, and if we're above the 5% threshold of poverty in North Andover, the grant is typically higher. If we dip below that, one year we cut, it was reduced by 183,000 that July, uh, which was significantly lower. We've been trending above that line. It's a lag of a couple years behind, and it's all done by the federal government, the, the federal census. Um, and I've actually argued with those folks in Washington, and I didn't get very far. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I have a question regarding the grants. Mm -hmm. Competitive yeah. grants that instituted are not federal or state. Um, uh, do you have a track record of proposals and wins kind of thing? So if, when the economy went bad a few years back, competitive grants uh, disappeared in quite a few places as money dried up. Um, we've been most successful now with grants around social emotional learning, um, you know, the uh, drug and safe, free, uh, safe and drug free school, um, the work that Cheryl Barzak does around the opiate grants. She's and, the head nurse. Uh, I mean, she's the lead, lead nurse for us in the district. Um, you know, we've had some luck. And just getting this ST Math grant um, with the work of elementary principals and Carol Lockholm, our STEM director, uh, is pretty awesome. They were hopeful to get one, and we got three. Yeah. We never thought we'd get more than one, and we got three this year. So, Circuit breaker reimbursement for special education expenses from the previous year. Um, any expenditure over four times the state per pupil cost for any one student uh, does not include transportation, um, and it's funded from state allocations. Um, it's determined annually up to 75%, as you guys follow. I know you guys follow Circuit Breaker very closely. Um, you know, and earlier this year there was talk of circuit breaker being funded at 65%, which is, which is, it's scary. Big, it's, a, it's scary. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I tell folks all the time, uh, anytime we can talk to our state legislatures about making sure we fully fund circuit breaker, making sure that we're advocating for the foundation, foundation. budget. Uh, you know, North Andover is one of the communities if the foundation budget ever passes, which it passed in the Senate recently, uh, the, the House had till last Thursday at 5 p.m. to take up, and there was no appetite to do so. Uh, so it's been pushed off to next year. Um, North Andover would see a huge increase um, in funding based on that formula. Um, capital projects? Yes, yeah, so capital projects, um, you've seen these become, become, we tie into what's going on in the town. I think the most recent one we had last year was the replacement of the turf on the high school fields, um, the, that sort of thing, roof replacements, et cetera. So that's another area we look to. Um, indirect expenses, um, I think Lynn kind of talked about these earlier as well. These are things that, um, like um, employee benefits, et cetera, as you see here, that uh, we have to cover as well. So there's a line item there, a budget item there. Um, and, and I think this is probably an area, when it works well, it works well. Um, some communities struggle with it. It always seems like a good idea in theory, but we've, we've been fortunate in North Andover um, to consolidate with the town side on a few things in the operating to budget. Uh, both technology and facilities are consolidated departments. Legal is a shared service. Um, I mean, 
Suzanne Egan has probably been a, one of the greatest assets for us um, because, you know, in our line of business, we deal with uh, labor attorneys and contract attorneys, uh, but the special education is also a separate attorney that's appointed by the school committee on an annual basis. Um, just the ability to have Suzanne where it's not, they're not checking off a box of 15 minutes, um, she's been able to pick up a lot of stuff that normally would go out. Um, and um, I can't speak more highly of the work she's done with us this year. Well, not only go out, or cases of not doing it at all, not asking the question because we don't want to spend the money. So now that we have this person, I mean, I, I've talked to her about lots of things on a regular basis, just our cleaning up some of our policy stuff. She's just done wonderful work. So that would have been something that would have been harder for us to pursue if we felt like we had to spend money on that. Um, of course, we are spending money on it, but, you know, in a different way. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, you don't want a lawyer without a license. Uh, right. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you more in the long um, run. You know, and I, it's fair to give an example. If we did try to consolidate, I think the, the payroll situation, and you know that found out that was not the best plan, but it was a good effort. We tried, and so constantly trying to find ways to, to find synergies um, that help everyone and save money at the same time. You know, another example. It's a small one, but symbolically, it's a huge one in this community. Is the shared librarian we've shared this past year. You know, that's a half-time children's librarian at the Stevens Memorial Library and a half-time at our, one of our elementary schools. Um, it's really been terrific. How are the libraries and the elementary schools staffed right now? How are they staffed? With librarians. With, with yeah. <laughs> no, 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 because actually not that, that. No, 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 because no. Like, no, I'm kidding. They didn't know, used to be. They were. They, they used that, to be parents, yeah. So, and so that, that's why I'm asking yes. this today. Going into the that's yeah. exactly right. If you I, saw I, Shawshank Redemption, uh, it was no, that's right. It was like uh, the parents with the book carts were like Brooksy. I mean, they would go room to room. Um, and well, and, the, and some of the li Thompson Library, when I have a, a sophomore, soon to be junior in high school, when she was in first grade, yeah, was, the library was a classroom. Mm -hmm. And so you had to go in and get the books and you wheeled them around. Um, now, but we have. Um, Professional librarian media specialist. It's made all the difference in the world. We have half a half time librarian media specialist at each elementary school, um, and not only have they done tremendous work around the appropriate um, responsibilities of a traditional library, but for example, now they're leading the curriculum work in um, something called keyboarding without tears. Um, so we're teaching all kids how to keyboard through library media specialists because that's the new handwriting. Of course, we still teach cursive, and I always tell the senior center when I visit there, we do the, the Pledge of Allegiance, and we still write in cursive, because that's the first two <laughs> questions they always ask me every time I go. Um, but just a skill like that is invaluable, because most kids grow up, they think everything's touch. You know, and now we're taking standardized tests that were judged on the MCAS in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and they're all computer-based testing. So what, um, what would be your goal at some point? You don't have to give a timeline or, or anything like that, but in a perfect world at some point to staff. What would be ideal to staff the library? So I, I know we've gone so far compared to what it was right. and just, I still hear that it's not, you know, there are some gaps in, in what parents may hope for. Yeah, I mean, ideally we'd like to increase that just as we'd like to increase reading teachers. Just like we'd write, you know, and it really comes down to what are the needs? And that's when we looked at like a, a consistent rigorous curriculum, we looked at, um, you know, uh, professional development. Um, a lot of needs are oftentimes based on where we're at, particularly around curriculum. So, okay. you know, we do assessments, for example, in mathematics. And, you know, if one class is 80% gets this concept, they don't spend a lot of time on it. But there may be another class that only gets 50%. So every year we have to carefully consider our needs. What are our needs in English language learning? Reading, guidance, social emotional learning, um, libraries, because you have to make decisions based on that. So, certainly, I think that we'd say, um, we've come very far. Just what is just what is appropriate? Is it one librarian full time at each Not, school? See, I don't think necessarily. Just that's we don't why, have that's right. We don't that. have one art teacher per school. We don't have one music teacher. There, okay. there's. I think that would be. I had two uh, when I was. I'm a million years old, but when I was a kid, I had a librarian and an assistant librarian. But we only had books too, though, right? So, um, I don't know that that would be the best use of the resources. But that's constantly the shift. I, I think a half time per school. That would be the dream date, probably, and we're pretty close to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And okay. at the middle That's school, my and, and at the middle school and high school, don't forget we're full time. Right. Per school. Yes. yes. So the middle school has a full time yeah. librarian, yeah. and so does the, um, an example though of the, how the, this now media specialist um, situation with the librarian has made a big difference. I have two daughters; they're five years apart, and the fifth grader just had her arts and academic night, and they put together a um, half an hour 
a bunch of skits about the Revolutionary War, and they did it with the green screen and the, the uh, library media specialist. They wrote them and everything, helped them film it. She put all the backgrounds on it, and they presented that to the class. They were giddy with joy. They were so excited to show us. And my sophomore actually said to me as we were walking out, and I said this to the school committee the other day, wow, that was amazing. Look how far everything's come in the last five years. Like We had a debate, and that's what we did about the Revolutionary War, and we wrote, you know, a a newspaper or something, but look what they just did. You guys have come so far. Like she said, you guys. <laughs> but um, I thought that was pretty impressive. And that couldn't have been done without the library media specialist. The teachers could not have pulled that off um, without that support. It was really kind of cool. Ed, this is for you. So Medicaid funding, um, typically um, we can be reimbursed within schools for providing services like occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, nursing services, particular services. Um, for special education students that receive, you know, mass health and things of that nature. Um, in the past, uh, you need a one-time sign-off um, for students in order to get the reimbursement. Um, it's a little tricky because sometimes parents who receive benefits from the state are nervous about signing off because they think somehow it's going to limit their benefits that they currently, even though it doesn't interfere with that at all. Um, we were typically around 12 or 13% signing the form. The money didn't ever come back to the schools. Uh, and many districts in eastern Massachusetts have made a move where the money comes back to the schools now. Went to the town. It, to the, it comes to the town, and then the town can allocate it to the schools. So before it just go back to the regular coffers at the town. Um, so this is, a, I think, a really great example of collaboration with Andrew Mailer. Um, Jen, Andrew um, had worked together on this so that the monies could come back to the schools, but only for curriculum purposes in perpetuity because one of the things we know in North Andover when budgets get tight, and, and I've seen it cyclical over the years, um, what's the first thing we always cut? Mm -hmm. We cut books, we cut resources. And when you go without those resources for a long time, there's an aggregate uh, effect or a cumulative effect of going eight, nine, ten years without that. And that's what we see happening because we've done everything we can to preserve classrooms. But th this is the lifeblood of what we do. So when the money was going to come back to the schools, um, the first year we put the placeholder for the teacher and we spent $55,000 on Lucy Calkins writing. Last year, um, a little over a year ago in the spring, uh, we made an all-out effort to get every single one of these forms signed. So um, myself and Jen Price uh, and many others, Cindy Parent, we went door to door. Um, we went door to door to all sections in North Andover, and we got these forms signed, explained to parents. We did mailings with return envelopes. We did everything we could. And right now we're up to, I think it's right around 95% signed. As a result, last year, we were able to get $250,000. I'm really happy to report. Um, it, these things lag, too. Anything with the state lags. Um, but the last quarter just came in for this year. Um, and right now it's up to 330000 for next year. And that's why at town meeting we asked the town to say up to 400000 I'd anticipate that I'll be coming back to everyone saying, you know, can we have this up to half a million or 600000 in the future? Because, um, you know, we provide the services for us to get the reimbursement. This makes all the difference. And this is how we've been able to do some things that just most districts locally aren't doing in terms of curriculum and professional development and doing it right. You know, a lot of districts buy Lucy Calkins writing and say, here you go, good luck. Um, but they don't have the training, the professional development. And um, on the last school committee agenda, um, I know some of you really like searching the internet. Um, there's the summer offerings we're offering in PD. That's what we're putting on. Teachers aren't required to come, but they want to come because it gives them the PDPs they need to stay up with their license, et cetera. And, um, all the, the real interest in it is all the new programming we're brought in with the Medicaid money. So uh, this is huge. This is huge. Now, um, there is a new provision under the law, and it will be starting in a year, um, where we can get reimbursement from seeing students who are not special education students. Um, so we'll most likely have an all-out effort um, to get those signed as well. In the old days, it used to be signed once a year a form. Now it's you sign it once and your whole career in a district and it's good for the entire time. Does that, does that make sense, Ed? It does. You, sure, you can end it. Uh, <laughs> grassroots effort. Yeah. It's I on mean, the table. Go get it. Yeah. I mean, we spent a lot of days, Jen and I, on my scooter. Um, <laughs> scooting around? Scooting around to houses. I mean, this is, um, this is what, this is how we're able to do the things for the kids that we do. 
Um, so I think that's important to mention. The special education stabilization fund is another example of folks uh, working with us on the town side, with the understanding that um, you know there were some years in the past where they were good years in special education in terms of a little bit of money extra that we could prepay going into the following year. Um, but one of the trends we've seen locally in Massachusetts, maybe even New England and the country, is more and more kids with social emotional learning disabilities that are causing them to go out. And earlier diagnosis with mental health issues. And I think and that's probably one of the reasons we have hired a director of social emotional learning. We realize that we need to, A, get our programs up to snuff, B, get our support staff trained the best they can be by an expert in the field, a clinician, and then lastly, get the teachers so they can do those tier one interventions in the classroom about what's best practice in terms of um, students who experience issues with mental health, social emotional learning, et cetera. Uh, so the special education stabilization fund was approved by town meeting vote and we can access up to $250,000 in one year and up to 400,000 in a two year period. And that provides, you know, that's something as a last resort that we'd ever want to touch. And I think that's been the attitude. Um, but that provides because, you know, uh, a placement is expensive, but transportation can be equally as expensive. Transportation could be anywhere from twelve, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars per student a year. So I have a question on special education, or actually a comment, observation. Um, this past year, you've had great success in keeping students in district, as opposed to going out of district for special ed. Correct. Correct. Yes. And it is substantially. I won't call savings because I don't see it that way, but it, it has reduced your cost quite a bit, right? Correct? Yep. It has. One of the key people, as I understand, um, Katie, is Katie Burnham a key person in this area at all? Kate Burnham is our special Kate. education um, administrator at the middle school. At the middle school. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm just, just what I've read in the paper about her moving on to a... a yeah, she just became the superintendent of Lunenburg. We're so yeah. happy for her. Yeah. Um, Does that have any impact on... But you see in this area? You know, I think one of the things is, I wouldn't call it a cost savings because what we've been doing with the money that we're bringing back yeah. is we're reinvesting it into programming. Um, so, you know, although we bring kids back, we know that if we can create programming that meets the needs of these kids, it's not only best for the kids, but it's going to be uh, not initially upfront a huge cost savings, but in the long run it will because we'll have tried and true tested special education programs that kids, parents will feel comfortable that their kids are in and we'll be able to service kids uh, and they won't be going out. Yeah. It's difficult to bring kids back in often. Yeah. There was absolutely no, I, I think this is one of the greatest areas you guys have handled the last couple of years and relatively to keep, uh, to keep the thing, keep the kids in, in district and to invest in the right people so that this happens and I, I think it's fantastic so well, and I, I, I the administration needs to get credit for the fact of hiring the social emotional learning director that we did last year very few districts have that so it was kind of like a leap gosh you're spending money on this on, you know another director time type of thing but the programming that she's able to put in place to again these tier one kids to keep them where they need to be we have a lot of other communities that are contacting you now saying, how did you do that? What is your model? Can you share it with us? So we're kind of leading the way on that. And I think that's impressive. Where do these kids go when they go out of district? Where's the primary location? Is it just another public school system like ours? No. Um, so it, it really, that's really very, um, it varies depending on the need. So, you know, we've really worked hard to keep our language-based learning kids in district. Um, but Typically, in other districts, you see those kids go to Landmark School oh, so or the Carroll School. school. Okay. Right. Uh, well, right. they're special education uh, approved state right. schools. Um, you know, kids with social emotional learning may be at Crest or at Seen Collaborative, okay. and we belong to the Crest Collaborative. Um, you know, you may have kids who um, have social emotional learning disabilities from severe childhood trauma, uh, and they may require special specialized school. You may have kids that are. Um, Completely in residential. So, so you look, you look. Hey, let me correct you if I'm wrong. When they do go out of district and they go to these specialized schools, the town, that's the town expense, the school expense. Right, right, yeah. right. I was going to say. And the transportation to get them there. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's substantial. Like a private school tuition plus an expensive. It's more expensive than a private school tuition. 
It's way more. Expensive. Yeah, because you're yeah, having right. hands-on services multiple times. Oh, high, high I mean, Brooks School is forty-eight thousand dollars a That's year, and this is. I mean, that, that would be on the low end. Exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I, I didn't. I didn't uh, yeah. really. I, I know it was a cost. I didn't really understand it the process. Depends, but yeah. some of it is. is Better. Yeah, I mean, so for us to reinvest is, makes the most sense for us because it, 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 it reduces our cost in the long run. Uh, and it's not only fiscally the right thing to do, it's also what's best for our kids. Because oftentimes you're putting kids on a bus for an hour. Yeah, like hour or two. I, like I know one kid that goes all the way to Arlington. Right. It's almost wow. a two-hour either way, and those kids are special. That's hard on them. It's that hard is. on a kid that isn't. And their families and everything. Oh. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So this is basically what we all just went through. These are the breakdowns from this last year's budget. Is this oh, sorry, attachment sorry. in our notes? Are you guys have... I'm going to ask. The, I, the, we just the, talked about it, yeah. Yes, I Do you yeah. mind? Okay. No, not at all. No, no, no. thank you. I wasn't Otherwise, sure if you guys already... I thought you guys already had it. So. No, we did not. Forward it. You then forward it to everybody in the committee. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but, the, you know, this is obviously the budget that's already gone through. So, um, and then... The last is really the you know benefits of working together. We, uh, Greg has highlighted this kind of along the way, but um, the fact that we've consolidated so many things uh, with the town, um, the support that we get in, in collaborating with the town is, is very important. I, I know that um, there was a time, and this was brought up, when um, there was a lot of arguing over who deserved the most money for what to get things done, and um, I think it is valuable to look at what we've been able to accomplish by collaborating. Um, for instance, we never could have gone with the full day, correct me if I'm wrong on this, the full day kindergarten a few years ago if the town hadn't given us the money to bridge that to get it started. They floated us that first year in order we to never get the Chapter otherwise. 70 money. And now, literally, we're the envy. I mean, they've been arguing about this in Andover now. Um, is this televised? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> they've been arguing this in a neighboring community. Um, this, is, this is a daily thing. I mean, they, it's $4,500 to send your kid. The school it used to be about three thousand here. Um, I was just sad that you know I had to pay the three thousand, and then actually my son <laughs> was in first grade. You know, I was hoping maybe he was a year behind, but um, you know, so that's an example of working together. That, that I think is is really valuable. Um, it's been a, going on ten years, right, of a collaborative uh, budget process, and you know, I'm sure the town manager wouldn't want us to say, but there are things that. When we get stuck, he helps us figure out without a lot of fanfare, right? So um, that's been very valuable to him um, on his part. And I have to say, there are very few, I know they, everybody talks about this all the time, but very few town managers, I would imagine, can get up at any meeting and, and in great detail talk about any element of our school um, initiatives, of our um, primary goals, of our strategic plan, he can speak to all of it himself. Um, I think that's that's pretty impressive, uh, and he's been very supportive of us. Um, the stabilization fund that was very smart. It seems like we need a snow removal stabilization fund as well. It sounds like, <laughs> um, and and you heard tonight also from uh, Lynn about the site work for the uh, the building the Aunt Brad Street. Um, the other key thing, and this is kind of a bridge into the the next part about the middle school. But um, as we've been talking about reducing class size for several years now, we knew that after we sorted out the kindergarten, the um, elementary schools, we needed to look at that middle school. Um, but we needed to get that ball. We felt like we needed to get that ball rolling early rather than wait till now to say, gosh, now let's start thinking about the middle school. So last year, we went to the selectmen, and they were very supportive. And everyone was about our submitting to the MSBA last year. So. Um, while we weren't ready to start that today, if we hadn't submitted last year and then now resubmitting this year, it, it traditionally takes multiple submissions to, to get anywhere. So the fact that we kind of came out early and that the town was supportive of that and that selectmen um, is very important uh, show of support for us. And I think people have been clear about that evil override wor word that, you know, it's going to take something like that to make this happen. So um, that's very important. I mean, it's great that we have a AAA bond rating, and we're very fortunate to be able to build a Bradstreet. But when you're talking about a middle school expansion, we're talking about a number that's very large, um, you know, $24 million. And it's large for me, large for us, large as a community. Um, but I think there's a couple of benefits here. There's one uh, with this MSBA process is, A, I think it behooves us to be able to have to go to them, the state building authority, school building authority, 
and I think would have to be turned down three or four times to, for, you know, for us to say, okay, what are the other alternatives that we could do? Because there's a significant reimbursement rate from the state, and I think that's really a responsible thing to do. Secondly, we used a consultant last year that really helped us, so I know some people were concerned they thought that the report was really dire. Um, but it's a very, very competitive process. I mean, we're in with some huge projects like Somerville High School, which is 286 million, Lowell High School, which is 300 million plus. Um, the Leahy School in Lawrence just got it, which is, I don't know if anyone's been to the Leahy School in Lawrence lately, it's really old. Uh, it's probably 100 years old. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a competitive process. And for us to apply, and almost 100 applied, and make it in the top 45, um, on our you know, first try. On our first try. They indicate that we were um, really even closer to the top 18 that were selected. What did we do well to, to do? What, what is it that they're looking for? Well, you got there, there's certain criteria. I know that um, I think last year Jen came to this group to discuss the, the criteria for, for support. Um, but what we're saying is, look, it, it, it's just simply overcrowded. We have, some of the, we have the largest, some of the largest middle school class size in the Commonwealth, number one. Number two, um, you know, Although we're making it work, um, it, you know, it's working. The kids are getting what they need. But I don't think it's working well in the sense of, for example, you take a related arts class where there's 70 kids. You know, you have the gymnasium. You have two classes and there are 70 kids. I think we even cited that in one of those components. You know, we have um, the project is to put in a science wing with the appropriate labs. I mean, you know, the, the, the labs in there now are small. Small, you know, restrict some. I mean, we're getting the kids at the core curriculum. We have the new standards and the new, you know, um, materials in place, but we could do a lot better. Yeah, I was wondering if, if, I mean, you guys do a good job, a great job with the limited budget. Does that work against you? I mean, you can certainly point to overcrowding, but what's the, what's the real pain point? I mean, overcrowding is a. Well, I think it's the functionality. And I think it's the overcrowding, and I think that that's, um, I think that's why we made it so far. Um, well, and, and the fact that you could, with a, you know, small, from their perspective, investment, you can make a huge impact. And I think that probably, we would probably that's be a, a you know, squeeze in between the, the gaps yeah. project right. rather than a that's $300 million need, that's project. A need, that's a checkbox and a success. And right. There's a reason. I'm trying to think what the angle is because, you know, yeah. rich town, why, why are we giving them? You're yeah. talking about Somerville and Lawrence. Well, and I'm just, I'm just trying yeah. to get a feel for Right. We're a good team. That's why I mentioned the numbers earlier because it might be. You know, they might just say, okay, we're going to fund Somerville at 286, and we can't fund, um, you know, a new Woburn Middle School, but we could come up with an expansion project and something to make a real difference for a community that has these needs as well. What's right. the pattern of reapplying every two years or more? Every, every, we yeah. already have reapplied this year. Um, and it's the same form as the. The, one the big thing that, uh, that they asked us, that they suggest we should add, would be what, did you, what was your estimated expense? And so we did put the estimated expense in this time. But otherwise, they, the feedback we got was your and the proposal expense came from that consultant. Right. And it's very you know, rough. He walked through for I understand. 10 seconds. I didn't know was the first one. That's what I was wondering. I was yes. interested that it was presented without numbers. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and we, and, and in fact, we use the consultant for the application process itself. And um, the number only represents the capital improvement, correct? Right. So this doesn't address the operating ongoing cost of staffing the new rooms. That's, so that's what the point I was going to make. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, w that that's a really good point. I mean, so you know, we're going to keep applying. We think we're going to get in this pipeline. Sure. Um, but then we will have a need at that time to backfill those positions. That's right. And that's going to be more than just, you know. Squeezing a few here and there like we have. Squeezing 10 in at the elementary oh, level. Like we've done five in two years. We, in the next budget cycle or two, we'll get the other five. Um, it's going to require, um, in order to make a difference, it's going to require staffing. How, do you have an estimate yet? Or is this 15 would be the, um, you know, is what would be freed up. So the idea, but like the, the, the because what we'd be doing is we'd be freeing up traditional science labs that are really outdated, and those could become regular general education classrooms or other appropriate classrooms. At the middle school, they're they're a team structure, and so there are three. That's right. The idea would be to add one more team at each level, um, which would be four teachers typically. Uh, there's some three teacher teams, but the, the goal is four. Um, yeah. So. And it's just like the, the same thing with the elementary school situation. First, you need to make the space to put bodies, and then you need to get the body the money for the bodies so and what the is, materials. So what is the timing? So we, you re reapply every year, and then if you are chosen 
it takes about seven years. Is that the? Well, so what happened, so last year, so we applied in, I think, February last year, and we heard in September that, hey, you made cut number one. We're bringing some people by to check it out. And then, that, did you go on that? I didn't go yeah, on that. I think Jim Amelie and Jim Price went on and kind of went around with the people that came. And then I think we heard in November, you were so close, or whatever we heard. And then they said, we really suggest you reapply. Um, and but once you so suppose they accepted us back in November they say hey you're one of the people then we invite you to start actually putting in a proposal so this is just to like come to the table this part that we've, we're in right now we um we this proposal no if we got to the table and made it to the next tranche then you hire a consultant to put together the detailed proposal, right? This has got to be an intense yeah. proposal. I would, I would we'd find out whatever puts us in the best. We'd do whatever puts us in the best position. Okay. Right. Okay. I would imagine, just, like just the fields project, there was a consultant. I'm sure we'd have to do the Get same kind of numbers. things. So it would yeah. be a few years before you actually start seeing. Correct. It. Yes. My question is that um, uh, why is it that we take one section of the school at a time, fix it, and then move to the next? The whole four years or you know the whole group uh, will move to another section so from elementary to middle middle to high if you leave middle and it takes a few years then that whole group will move to high school so they will miss out on all those things so when you started focusing on elementary why didn't you focus on middle also at the same time so that both de developed I, I, think, I think we have. Well, by doing the MSBA, we have. Again, we had to find how can we make an impact as quickly as possible. This just, class size was just discussed. Like, no, no offense to all of us. Three years ago, we didn't notice that we had big class sizes. We weren't upset. We weren't complaining until it was pointed out. Gosh, these are awfully crowded. We should do something about that. Oh, yes, we should. And we built, now we're building a kindergarten. That was done very quickly with money that the town had. That we could access it's again. A huge impact. Right, and it's having a seventy to fifteen percent. And, and that's, that's so yes. quickly so without having to go to. A, I'm sorry. We're not monitoring. No, I, I'm. I'm saying. No, we have been. Yeah, by, oh, but no one's been. Like people I are super upset about, about it now. Nobody was upset three years ago. She's, she's about talking about the no. general public, not the general public, not all of us. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. What I'm saying is, there's a lot of attention to it now. The numbers were extremely high in North Hampton for a long time. And nobody was right. hysterical. There was not an appetite for change. Until we pointed out, look at the impact we can make quickly with a small amount of money. That's to get you started, but well, with the next plan. impact. Right. With a plan was that was more thoughtful. Of an appetite from certain generations. So, so was it not a priority until the parents became outraged? No, no, it was. I'm saying no, before. Fair. We taught the parents to be outraged, is what I'm saying. <laughs> the okay. citizens weren't. Well, I'd say this. I, I would say that, you know. More importantly, there weren't a lot of opportunities with the money that was available right. to the community to lower class size right. because right. there was no space. So even if you come up with money here or there, it's not that people didn't care that class size was high. They certainly did. I mean, there was one year in 2002 or three class size was up around 35, 36. They hired some mid-year teachers to alleviate that. But there was no space to physically put people. You know, the population has stayed about the same in, our, in terms of our student population. There's just different pressure points. Um, the ability to have a thoughtful, deliberate plan that's sustainable that's right. has that's made right. the difference. Because every year going what we've seen in North Andover is, you know, when money's tight, and there were a lot of years money was super tight, and people weren't working together, you know, the, the dam has a crack in it, and you fill one piece to make that better. And while you're doing that, something else goes. Um, so I think the, the ability to have a plan be thoughtful, deliberate, uh, and strategic makes a difference. So well, for California, I think, has a law now, max of 26 or 27 per, per class. Are there not regulations or laws? How do we get to 35? There are no regulations. No, no, no. We tried to meet the state, at least the state. Uh, but the state yeah. standard is yes, a standard, yes. not required. It's not required. Yeah, there's, there's, there's and no and match. our school committee, fifty, if you just ran our school committee numbers that we would yes. like is not a law required either. I mean, if you don't have the money or the space to put them, right. you can't just do it. But we certainly want to take care that it is important. And the fastest way that we could make an impact quickly was to start there. 
Yeah. But that's what I was trying to say earlier. While we were starting there, we already started the middle school through the MSBA to pay attention to that and not wait till, okay, we just moved everybody in. Now let's start looking at the middle school. We try to start right. at the You're same time. Right. You're running parallel. You're Correct. not being linear. Right. About it. But you just can't, is a bigger I mean, amount of money for the yeah, That's right. But we can't, the town can't just say, you know what, based on free cash and various things, we can help you finance that right now. That's not going to happen. And, so, and just remember, I mean, it was 2006, we cut $3 million. Um, yeah, it's just 2008 ruined everything. So, um, and I would say this, there's a line, and I don't know it exactly. John Kennedy used to say it a lot about planting a tree. You know, there's not enough trees, you know, and they're like, you should have planted it 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, we're planting them now. Well, and that was, I think, one of the things, too, about putting the MSBA proposal in last year. Like, gosh, don't we wish that somebody had done this a couple of years ago? Well, let's be those somebody rather than three years from now say, gosh, don't you wish we did that three years ago? Um, so in that same thought, you know, along mm -hmm. those same lines of thinking, would it be appropriate to consider um, hiring a consultant in advance of being accepted by the MSBA because uh, essentially regardless of where the funding come fr comes from, we would still need a, a consultant to provide us with a plan to move forward for the costing for that matter. Right. I mean, so, and, and I don't know. I don't know if the requirements from the MSBA are different than what we would do if we didn't receive funding from that um, group. So, just kind of curious. Yeah, I, I don't know the definite would, answer to that, it, but it I know. It would be something to consider. There's a town next to us. I won't mention. Um, they're considering. Um, you know, they're having a lot of financial issues uh, back and forth, and uh, it's not as harmonious, but. They're, they're looking at self-funding, which I don't think they're going to be able to do, and they've also put into some MSBA projects. Well, well, but regardless, right, if we, are, if we have to pay a consultant a certain amount, and it's, it's work that is not going to be duplicative if we, right? I, what, I, what I would want to check is it's possible that if you get accepted to... You get, they fund the consultant that's, as well? That's right. I don't know. I believe, that, isn't that correct? Correct? I believe that's correct. So if you hire them in advance, you may not get reimbursed. Correct. That's yeah. correct. No. So you're, while you want to be proactive... No, that makes sense. Right. These consultants are not fifty thousand. They are. They're. They're big money. Yeah. Would Lowell or Lawrence share them? Actually, Methuen's actually looking right now for four million dollars in a home rule petition uh, that they're short in the schools. Yes. Um, yeah. That's and, right. And, and yeah. some. So I'm. Yeah. I'm on a. Um, a borrowing plan, just like if you remember years back, uh, Lawrence did a borrowing plan, and they got a state overseer for finances about ten years ago. Um, I, I, I would just say this. Yes. I, I, I think that um, you know we have a direction we want to head. We have a strategic plan, a curriculum plan, a student services plan. Um, I take your point. My son's a fourth grader. He may never see that at the middle school. Yeah. You know, my daughter's an eighth grader at North End of the Middle yeah. School. My kids will never see this either. That being said, doesn't mean it's not right. <laughs> it's our job to provide the best education we can for kids now with what we have, prepare for the future arm teachers with the tools and things they need to navigate 180 days of teaching kids. And, you know, we believe that by getting the support, going early on the MSBA, uh, it's a real step in the right direction. And I think that um, based on the feedback we have, I think that there's a good chance that we're going to have some success with this. Um, I have asked this question uh, before also, and I'll ask again. Are we not open to private funding, or is there any uh, restriction to private funding? So there are a lot of rules around ethics uh, and different things, but um, we've certainly had private funding help us with um, different projects this year. A uh, very generous family here in North Andover in the last two years has donated probably over close to $25,000 just so we could accelerate our phonics program at the elementary. The, buying the materials. So what are uh, the restrictions or what are the I don't know the answers to that. I have to research it. We'd have to talk to town council. We can, yeah, folks. so can we open it to businesses or uh, individuals who would Is fund? Who knows? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Well, I mean, also, we, we, I mean, the, uh, you know, um, the, the work around our educational foundation, um, you know, and the donations there uh, have made a difference in our work around the Lilith Fund. Uh, to send our kids on the overseas trips who can't afford it uh, as part of a high school experience. Um, our daughters did that. You know, uh, in the sense of, like, big business, you know, the one thing about North Andover that's a little different, um, you know, because I have friends who are superintendents in other places with lots of Burlington has. Yeah, Burlington has. Yeah. Of, yeah. They don't um, have a big business. We don't. We have mom and pop shops. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, I, Terry Holland probably personally donates over $20,000 worth of pizzas yes. a year <laughs> to I'm our sure district. Yeah. Um, you know, and when you talk about places like Burlington, 
you know, they've been able to be funded a ton of computer materials. But yet we're, you know, and they spend a lot more than we do, and we're outpacing them on the MCAS, for example. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses to it, but it's also, too, it's to the point where you have to be really careful about outside money and then what is it that they want in return and what kind of leverage and, 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 and or advertising and things of that nature. I think one of the questions or one of the pushbacks you're going to get on just lowering class size for the sake of lowering class size is we, we have been relatively successful. I know I have three kids that went through the system. They did well. I mean, I, I, I don't remember fighting at night about overcrowding in the schools. Not that I don't get all the reasons why we would want to bring the class size down, but but what are the gaps in town in terms of the education? I think of students in terms of struggling students, kind of guys in the middle, and then you got the really bright kids. If you've got kids in one of those three buckets, like what's different going to school in Reading or Stoneham that probably has three less students per class than we do and maybe spends another 1500 bucks on making those numbers up? pretty well documented correlation almost all educational outcomes in class size. That's right. That's not really so, right. Is that true? I don't know it's if that's true. Because the teachers, when they have fewer students to work with, and then you... It makes they, sense in theory, but is it really proven? They can differentiate yeah. for, more, yeah. for yeah. individual programs. More and more that's right. Yeah, individual so you models. need some reading support. You know, you need to be doing your own research project because you're that avid a reader or what have you. And so as a teacher with fewer students, I can really cater to each of my students. So what is it? I mean, I get the benefits of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, the school real estate, the mm -hmm. real estate values are based on school performance, things like that. But what is the, I, I think you have to break it down and, and what is the deliverable though? What, 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 how does it feel different to people in the town? And I'm speaking as a taxpayer, right, not right, as right, a, right. Wh whether or not I support it or not. I'm, I would just say this, when you, when you have 27 kids, for example, in a second grade classroom and there's one teacher and, the, and, and you, you might have one aide that supports a student on an individual educational plan. I mean, so if you have a group of kids there, they're the high flyers right away that you get. Uh, you have kids in the middle that are uh, having productive struggle on a daily basis. And you have kids who it's like a foreign language to mm. um, and frustration. Sure. We're asking our teachers with this shifting demographic and more kids with social emotional learning issues, um, you know, and, and I mean, the, the, the research is really clear. Student outcomes are really impacted by socioeconomic, socioeconomic status. They're impacted by whether a student's special education or not. And this class size plays a huge role in it because Te the, the more kids we have, the less effective that teacher can be in order to make an impact to work with those students. And if the student falls behind, the more money is spent for the rest of the life of their education than if they have nipped it in the bud in first and second grade, for example. Right. Okay. And, and that's, that, why the and that's is also so not just education, it's social emotional awareness, and you get gang, you get emotional problems of kids, you get kids that then leave the public school because they can't hack it because they're not getting the attention that they need. There's an a, a, a dollar. high school graduation rate, and what is it trending, and how does that compare to the state average? It's, um, off the top of my head, I want to say it's 99-something. It's high, high. I, I get, like 90, it's, yeah, it's like 98, yeah. And 90 percent of our kids go on to yes. college. There's a whole list online. What percentage goes on to college? 90 percent, 75 percent matriculate to a four-year college, the rest to a two-year college, mm -hmm. and the other 10 percent are typically military and or work, right and sometimes um, vocational training, et cetera. Yeah. We have focused a lot on, um, which is good, uh, on kids with needs. Uh, what are you doing for kids with, uh, with uh, higher abilities? So that's why we just brought in the most rigorous math curriculum, K-6, to there, I think, that's on the market, the Eureka Math. Um, but that is being taught to all the kids together, right? Not especially for the kids the who are... Level. No, but this, that goes back to Ed's question. There's, you, you, they differentiate those lessons. So, um, you know, if any of you have little ones and doing Eureka Math, um, anyone here? I do. No. Oh. He eventually will be, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard work. We want to bring in the most challenging curriculum for our kids that's consistent across all the schools. Um, and part of that smaller class size also is the ability to differentiate. Have the supports for the kids who need so the support. If a child is very bright, what are you going to do for, for that child? Just exactly what we were saying um, earlier. If a child was struggling, so it, it, you know, if a student's, a, we want, we know what we want kids to know and be able to do. So what if they get it right away? We have to have a plan to challenge them. What if they don't get it at all? We have to a plan to remediate them, and that's our that that's yeah, what powerful. we work on on a daily basis. I mean, that's why we collaborate. That's why we have the early releases so teachers can look at student work and say, these are things we're going to do to challenge kids who get it right away. 
based on this student work. These are things that are going to work and we're going to monitor. Uh, in some ways, um, interventions for kids, you know, I, we've mentioned tier one interventions tonight. I'm not sure how many are familiar with that. Um, but those are the interventions that we train teachers that are moves that they can make within the classroom that is the first line of defense um, for kids who need extra help for whatever particular reason. But if a child who is in third grade and is able to do seventh grade mathematics, for example, what are you going to do for that child? We're going to challenge that kid. Uh, give more. We're going to we're going to give them and more. The same teacher would be able to address. Uh, and it becomes easier with lower class size. Yes. That was Ed's point. So, do we have like one more question? I'm sorry. I, I talked a lot. I, so, to so kind of go full circle. Okay. So, this is really, really helpful. At least I was going to say, is me. this helpful or is this For, It was incredibly helpful no, to, to put it all together. Um, and then, how does this translate into? Um, what we would look at or what would be helpful for our, us and you guys um, in terms of um, what you, your financial budget will look like. So these initiatives are incredible and you're making do with you know, a lot less resources than other communities. But um, to meet those goals, what resources do you need or, or how does that look going forward? I well, think it's what Greg has said is the plans are all here. What it would just do would be to accelerate it. Like we wouldn't suddenly, I maybe would, I don't know, go buy some other huge thing, I don't know, but it would be able to, the, the path that we're on is the right path, it's just how fast we can make it happen. And so basically, whatever budget is, um, whatever funds you're allocated right. as, as the school department, you'll use those to put in place whatever you can intelligently from your plan and then, and then go from there. And then what would change is if there was additional revenue, then it would accelerate your, your plan. I'm just trying yeah. to understand how I, I, I would say that a couple things. I think one is I think my entry plan is going to provide data about possible gaps or things that we may want to awesome. focus on that would mm -hmm. cause, you know, um, I wouldn't say a mid shift, a mid course correction, but it, it, it definitely provides. I mean, it's a community survey that's going out to everyone online. Uh, I am meeting with more groups, I think, than any superintendent ever has. I want to hear uh, from folks in this community that have traditionally not had a voice. So I'm purposely having a night down at the Veterans Housing Projects on Baldwin Street. I'm purposely having a night at Royal Crest. I'm purposely a night having a Woodridge. Folks that don't normally get involved in the schools, I want their voices heard. But secondly, um, that, those data points around what new programming, what do you see with your own kids, what would you like to see, what advice do you have, I'm going to code all that and present that to the school committee in December. Additionally, I think that as a leadership team working with the school committee, we take our job very We're entrusted with the care of almost 5,000 kids daily, and two of them are my own. And we work really hard in the budget season to say, what are our needs now, you know, based on our strategic plan, in line with our strategic plan, and have those changed where we might need something else? You know, I think a good example is the Medicaid funding. You know, um, the ability to get that $400,000 for next year is a huge impact. Because typically, it would just be level services, the increases we need to open a new school, and that's it. Um, so we have to continue to be creative. We have to continue to work together. Um, and we, you know, we continue to push for the, what we think are the needs. But we also know there's a finite amount of money. Um, I've been down the road, or I've seen it. I've witnessed it. Um, How long have you lived here? Well, I've been an employee for 20 years. I've been a night school teacher, a teacher's aide at the middle school a high school history teacher, a track coach, a football coach, a high school vice principal, an elementary principal, six years as assistant superintendent, and now in my 21st year going in as superintendent. I've seen times when the selectmen and or school board or school administration or folks in town have lost their credibility. I think we're the most credible we've ever been because we do what we say we're going to do and we follow the plan. I've seen times where you know, I've, I witnessed once as a teacher where they said we need 41 new teachers if we don't have an override or they're going to be all laid off. And I think there was a net gain of two on top of the 41 that year. Um, you know, so I can only speak to what I've witnessed in this community. I can only speak to the credibility that we have, you know, and I think working together um, has allowed us to do things that I witnessed in my first 10 years of employment in North Andover with people working really hard and really good people, but things weren't getting done. 
you know, um, you look now, I mean, I just, in this short amount of time to be in this building on the side of Johnson High School, which opened up in 1867, right here, to have Kittredge Gym, to have a fire station, a police station, a senior center for our seniors, um, you know, the yeah. ability to build the Brad Street, <laughs> um, you know, all different funding sources, but I think the creativity and the collaboration mm -hmm. make a difference because I've seen when it's been ugly. I've seen um, budgets where we put together wish lists. You know, if we got 11%, we get this. If we, you know, and we've been down that road, and right. um, it's, um, you know, I think we push. We're optimistic. I think we're on the right path. I think we have the right plans in place. We have the right people in place. People are on the right seats in the bus. Um, and we'll continue to push for what we need for our kids. Um, I know you guys, like, please get out of here. <laughs> well, no. I, I, it's been said. This was well done, well, well thought out, very informative. Very educated. Did we very cover educated. the middle school stuff enough for you too? Uh, yeah. You know, well, it's an introduction. Now, I mean, it it's it's, it's an introduction document. It's basically a doom and gloom. Oh my God, the sky is falling. I get it. Um, but um, let's get the let's get it the second round. That would be fabulous. That would be great. Guys, thank you for allowing me to come and introduce myself tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Thank thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank appreciate it. We haven't done it yet. Our last They're fine. There's no problem. They're fine. They can leave. Right. Wait, this is all public record. Yeah. Well, it's all right. You touched it. Things that, if you notice, we started at 7 o'clock today. I like to continue that 7 o'clock. <laughs> Um, and it just helps ease some of the pressure with all the traffic going on, including myself. Even though I'm 17 miles away, it still took me a long time to get into here today. So I was like, I'm going to keep it at 7 o'clock for now. The agenda format is a work in process. Uh, Sasha pointed out the school committee's methodology. I do like it, and it helps maintain and keep the uh, organization of the meeting. Um, Finance Committee and Board of Selectmen meeting. I have uh, people who are on the board right now, which will have a new chair after, July, after June 30th, who have already indicated to me, yes, let's do it. They've asked me for some dates, and I have provided them with some tentative dates uh, of early September. Um, they haven't gotten back to me, but I believe that once the chair has been appointed, that will happen. We have currently an August 14th um, Planning a meeting, uh, finance committee meeting. I'm going to call it still a little tentative. I need to do is put together an agenda. Um, last, as far as my meetings go, I sent to all of you forwarded from Amy the open house honoring Dr. Jennifer Price. It's scheduled for it's it's going to be scheduled. It's on June 26th at the Stevens Estate with an RSVP by this uh, by the Friday before. Um, I'm going. And it's up to you whether or not you want to come. Yeah. Yep, that gets that gets up. Yep. So um, relative to next season, we got a few things that I would like to just sort of keep your minds on. Chuck, uh, Ed, we do have an election of chair and vice chair with the new fiscal year. So that'll be perhaps on the August 14th. Uh, I'd like to have the new member or members or whatever, the finance committee is part of that. Uh, relatively all signed up before we do that, but uh, we'll play that one right here. But it's either going to happen in the August meeting or the early September meeting. OPEB, right now Chuck and um, Jen are on that committee. Um, it's, as far as I'm concerned, there's two good people that have been representing, uh, representing us on that committee. Um, but again, that will be a couple, a couple positions that someone might be interested in, just for thought. The Revenue and Fixed Cost Committee, which is probably one of the better things that anyone could do from this committee, you get to learn all about the revenues from the town, where it's coming from, and all the fixed cost. It's a very informative process, highly recommended. We have two uh, Finance Committee members who are uh, assigned to that, 
and we like I like to get that assigned early. There are no fixed dates relative to other than October. The October dates of two or three meetings in October, but they tend to be a little more flexible as we found out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also like to see if we can not get a more active presence with the school committee meetings. Um, I know Stan started a practice when I first came on the finance committee being the sole person always at the finance committee meeting. He continues to do that even though he's so not on the school. But he does, doesn't he? Yeah. Or, or, or Stan, get a life. Get a writer and yeah, just so start dictating, please. He does. But, but it, his, his philosophy, which is a very great one, is that it's a, an effective means of communication. Things that you heard Greg talk about and others have talked about in the past where there was conflict. Um, when Stan went to the Finance Committee meetings, and I don't think the Finance Committee members, except for maybe one or two people might go to the school committee member meetings, I mean, all of a sudden, those barriers started breaking down. And it was a very effective means of communication and understanding and listening to the other party and getting it firsthand. So uh, I would like to think about one or two of us also maybe rotating on school meetings uh, for this coming fiscal year. And that's all I've got for that part of the presentation. Uh, Public comment? So let me just, nice segue, right? Yeah. So, my name is Stan Limpert. I live at 43 Stone Cleave Road. Um, so, as the uh, president of the North Andover Historical Society, let me give you a little history, right? So, let's, <laughs> let's do a walk down memory lane on this thing. When I first got on the school committee in uh, 2008, there was a lot of animosity between all the boards and committees in town. It was really, it was pretty bad. It was not good. And so I uh, sort of decided that one of the committees that I was going to try to understand better and try to make friends with was, in fact, the Finance Committee. So I started going to Finance Committee meetings, and there was a lot of hostility at the beginning. And it got to the point where I didn't quite understand it, to be perfectly honest. I didn't know, you know, I was the new guy, and they were being hostile to me. They were, you know, sort of very aggressively asking me for information and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't understand it. Finally, after I'd been going a few times, I, they sort of decided I wasn't a bad guy. So as we're walking out after the meeting, one meeting, I said, why is there all this hostility? And so they explained that previously, this is like, so that was 2008, 2009. In like the early 2000s, they would ask questions of the school department, and the school department would just flatly refuse to give me information. I said, well, how could you do that? That's public information. I don't know, but we'd ask them for stuff, and the superintendent would just say, no, I'm not giving it to you. I said, well, that would make me hostile, too. So, you know, they would ask me for information. I would go back, get it, give it to them. So pretty soon, we broke down a lot of those barriers, and things got a lot better with the Finance Committee. It took us a while longer with the Board of Selectmen, I, I will add. Um, I would add to um, what uh, Dr. Gilligan had said, that... Transparency was another thing we brought to the budgeting process. So, you know, now our budgets are available to everyone online. Everybody, uh, the school committee budgets, can anyone can go look at them. And there's no, there's nothing hidden there. If you want to see if there are too many administrators, go look. You know, if, you, if that's what you think is a problem, you can go look at it. Um, the one thing I would say and echo some comments that uh, both Ms. Mabel and, and uh, Dr. Gillingham made. I think one of the biggest changes uh, that's come about in the last six or seven years has been our new town manager. I think we don't realize um, what an impact he's had on everything we, we do. So a lot of the initiatives that were briefed tonight are as a result of his uh, initiatives or his cooperation in trying to do new things, Medicaid, the Special Ed Stabilization Fund, uh, the consolidation of departments. For example, we're light year, the school department is now light years ahead in technology. As a matter of fact, I think I would put it up against almost any school district now for its level of technology. But to make the technology work, it meant that the town, the municipal side, had to provide the bandwidth for all that technology, which they have done. We have probably higher bandwidth in North Andover now as a town than probably any other community around here, you know, a couple of gigs, you know. So 
there's been a strong sense of cooperation with everything that the municipal side has done and it's really a lot of that is due to the town manager it was huge um, that he took us to the GIC because not only did he give us the money that he mentioned that the uh, Lynn Savage mentioned tonight that we've had available, but it, it stabilized our health insurance costs, which were rising dramatically and eating up a tremendous amount of the budget. You know, it was a, becoming a real problem. So that initiative alone was a big help in trying to get us all to a stable funding point of view. Um, prior to his arrival, we used to play what I used to affectionately term budget poker. You know, we'd start out, the, the town manager would offer the school department like a percent and a half, and we'd go in and ask for seven or eight, and then we'd just play poker until we got to a number that we could barely live with. And it usually was often less than three. It was a tough, it was a tough go. And we would meet weekly for two months from January into early March to try to figure out how to get the money. We don't, the school department does not have to do that anymore. You know, it's a very rational process. The town manager is very supportive. And it's like, here's what I've got. I'm splitting it up among all the departments. That's it. It's, it's really improved everything about the way budgeting is done. So, you know, we've made tremendous strides. You know, would any of us like to have more money for all our departments? Of course we would. Of course, we'd like to have everybody have more of what they, what they could need, what they need and what they could use for everything they're doing. But it is a progressive process. Um, as you all know, we have sort of a fiscally conservative community, right? So I got chided once when I was on the school committee. I used the O word in the meeting. And after the meeting, I got beat about the head and shoulders. Don't ever <laughs> use that word in the meeting again. That's televised. Um, our, our community has been supportive when there was a real need, as we know from the Override, the last override we did have, which was to help save our schools. But typically speaking, it's not, it's not that fiscally liberal about handing out money. Um, so we have to be careful about how we ask for money from the, the voters and the taxpayers. And we're going to need some money for the middle school. We're going to need a debt exclusion override if we want to make that work. So you know, that's kind of the next thing I see being on the list. And then after that, we can think about other kinds of sources of revenue and ways to get money. But I think it's dramatic to me how far we've come in, you know, less than a decade anyway. It's just been dramatic. And, you know, part of it's also due to our wonderful superintendent who was unfortunately leaving us. You know, she was the one who got us started talking really seriously about class size, right? Everybody else before that just like, yeah, 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 well, that's an issue. We'll deal with that someday. She really put it, you know, at the top of her list. And, you know, so now you can see where that's taken us. We're addressing it in a serious fashion, and we're going to make some progress with it. So, you know, could things be better? Of course. Could we have more funds and do more? Of course we could. But we've made it a tremendous distance already, and I, I think it's important that we all remember that. We've, we, we've come a long way in this. And, you know, we're, we still have a lot of good ahead of us and a lot of good plans, as you've heard, from the, you know, the school committee and the administration. And so I think we're going to get there. I really do. I think it's going to be good. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any other public comment? Very good. I did air. I jumped. Actually, I didn't time-wise. I was right on with the public comment. But I do have a couple minutes that we just want to get done, completed. Um, the, these are the meeting minutes from our last two meetings. Uh, I can see Angela on the 15th in the middle paragraph. Uh, the conservation circled around the senior center. It's really the conversation. That's not quite all right. The word spell check was perfect. <laughs> she, she wasn't referring to some sort of plant that grows around the country. That's, that's right. That's, it, it, uh, some sort of growth, that's right. I thought the O word was Oswald. 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 Oswald.
They're linked, you know. Mm-hmm. Any comments on the minutes? Oh, the conservation. Do we have a motion? I hereby move that we approve the meeting minutes for the Town of North Andover Finance Committee for the meeting date of May 8th, 2018, as written. I second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Any other motion? For the 15th. Um, which JM, who's JM in the call to order, right below my comment? Who does JM Do they know? Should that be AM, Andrew Mallet? No. He didn't come into our room. It should be oh. Jack. I thought it was me. Yeah. Oh, JJ. Sorry. JG. It's okay. JG. Sorry. It's okay. I just wondered if I there was somebody else in the room and I forgot. That's yeah. no. No. Is it your imaginary <laughs> friend. <laughs> yes. That sits on my shoulder, my beating up my right side of my head. <laughs> Any motion for th those corrections? I hereby move we accept the Town of North Andover Finance Committee meeting minutes for the meeting dated May fifteenth, twenty eighteen as amended by Tim to make a typo correction and by Jen to clarify her initials. I second. Uh, discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Do I have a motion? <laughs> Do I have a motion? I move that we adjourn the meeting. Second. Any discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good, thank you very much.